Consider an arrangement of three pairs of parentheses. This is one valid way to arrange them, but in fact, there are five ways to validly arrange three pairs of parentheses. But what if instead of three pairs, we had an arbitrary number of pairs? How many ways would there be to validly arrange them? The key insight here is thinking about what it means for parentheses to be in a valid arrangement. For example, this arrangement is invalid. But why? Well, we've closed the parentheses before we opened it, and this is not allowed. More generally, for an arrangement to be valid, there can be no point reading from left to right in which more sets of parentheses are closed than open, and every pair of parentheses that is opened must at some point be closed. It helps me to think about this by imagining that every open parenthesis is a plus one and every closed parenthesis is a minus one. Then if you sum the numbers one at a time from left to right, at no point should the partial sum be negative and the total sum must be zero. In fact, we can take this idea a step further and visualize each arrangement of parentheses as a staircase walk. Each open parenthesis corresponds to taking a step up and each closing parenthesis corresponds to taking a step down. Remember the two restrictions I mentioned a moment ago. They apply here as well. Firstly, the walk must lie completely on or above the horizontal axis on which it begins. This corresponds to not being able to close more parentheses than you've opened. Second, the walk must end on that same horizontal axis since this would mean that each open parenthesis has a closing one paired with it. Also, remember that the only two steps we're allowed to take are up and to the right, or down and to the right. We can't go backwards. And now, we've completely transformed the original problem into something that's easier to think about and work with. To answer the question of how many valid arrangements there are with n pairs of parentheses, is equivalent to asking how many walks there are following the aforementioned constraints that end at the point labeled 2n. But let's ask ourselves an easier question to begin with. How many paths are there to get to the point p? Well, notice that to reach this point, we must pass through one of the two points to its left, since these are the only points that can reach p in one step. So the total number of paths to p will be the sum of the number of paths to these two points. Since we could either take any path to the first point, then step to p, or take any path from the second point, then step to p. Using this method, we could compute the number of steps it will take to reach any point in the lattice. But this isn't a very satisfactory answer for me, because this really isn't much better than manually counting up all the paths to point p which is essentially what we're doing, just using a more structured method. It may be tempting to relate this to Pascal's triangle, and use some of the nice properties it has to answer this question, since they both have in common the method of finding one term from the sum of two previous ones. And in fact, we would actually generate Pascal's triangle if we didn't have the constraint that the paths can't go below the zero line. But with this constraint, it is not so straightforward relating it to Pascal's triangle. So, I will show a different method, which actually becomes very useful for describing properties of a variety of walks with different constraints. Hmm. Notice that this one big path can be seen as multiple smaller paths following the same two constraints as the original. In particular, look at the first point where the path touches the floor. Everything before this point can be seen as its own path, since it never goes under the floor, and it ends on the floor. Same goes for the path to the right of this point. But we can say even more about these paths. Let this shape represent all possible paths which obey our two constraints, that the path lies completely above the floor and ends on the floor. Now let us try to define this blob. The simplest path it could represent would be a path of length 0. I will draw this as just a point, since it never even leaves the floor. And we know that if it's a path of any other length, the first step we take must go up, since we aren't allowed to go below the floor. 
and if we go up, we must eventually return to the floor. But what happens between taking a step up and taking a step down? Well, anything could happen, so long as it doesn't touch the floor, since we're choosing to let this point represent the first time we touch the floor after leaving it. So we can simply put our blob symbol here to represent any path that doesn't go below the line at y equals 1. We are allowed to write the blob here, since we want any path here that does not go below the line that it started on that also ends on that same line. And then once we return to the floor, we are allowed to leave it again, so we can represent the rest of this path with another blob. And though it may not seem like it, this recurrence relation completely defines the possible paths we can take following our constraints. For example, consider this path. We can break it down into an up step, another path from the set of paths that follow the two constraints, then a down step followed by another path. And those two other paths can also be broken down into an up step, down step, and two other paths. But what if we have a path that only has an up step and a down step? How is this described by the recurrence relation? It may not be obvious at first, but this one can also be broken up in the same way. The up and down steps are not too hard to find, but where are the other two paths? Well, remember that we define the path of length 0 to be one of our paths. So if we write this path in blob notation, we can replace the blobs with the path of length 0, and we end up with the path we're interested in. So this seems like a pretty good way to describe these paths, but how can we use this to find the total number of paths for some length? Also, why have I decided to join the path of length 0 in the blobby path with a plus sign? That seems like an arbitrary choice. These are good questions. To answer this, though, we have to think about the method that we're going to use to count the length of each path. Consider the following path. If we want to count the length of this path by hand, it would make sense to look at each segment starting at 0 and add 1 each time to count the total number. In this case, the sum comes out to be 6 indicating that the path has a length of 6 units. But, let's consider a different method to count the path lengths. I'm going to make a variable called z, which we will be using purely as a counting variable. This time, we will start at 1, and for every segment of the path, we will multiply by z. The result of this product will be z to the 6th, and by looking at the exponent, we can know that the path has a length of 6. But, why would we want to count using a counting variable instead of just counting regularly? Isn't this overcomplicating things? Well, there's actually a really nice property that we get when we count using this method. What if instead of just counting the length of this path, we wanted to count the number of paths which have length 6? Imagine that we have a set of all possible paths that follow our two constraints. Now, count all of them using the counting variable z. Notice that exactly 5 of these paths produce z to the 6, which corresponds to the fact that there are only 5 paths of length 6 in this set. Now, let's take all of the results of counting these paths and add them together. We get an infinite sequence of z's raised to different powers. Now, if we join in like terms, the coefficients tell us how many paths there are with the length indicated by the exponent. For example, look at 5z to the 6th. We can interpret this as saying that there are 5 different paths which have a length of 6. So in this single series, we have encoded how many paths there are of any length. Notice that all of the exponents are even, since any odd length could not possibly end on the floor, and so wouldn't meet our constraints. Now we know how to interpret this series, but how can we generate it? Remember the recurrence relation we made using the blob? This describes paths of any possible length. What happens if we try to count the number of paths using a counting variable? There are only two units of path visible here, so we'll go ahead and label them with z. And let's give the blob a name. We'll call it m. Writing this as an equation, 
we get m equals 1 plus z times m times z times m. We are writing the path of length 0 as a 1 in the equation, since we know there is exactly one path of length 0. This could equivalently be written 1 times z raised to the 0. The exponent, meaning we are talking about paths of length 0, and the coefficient, meaning that there are only one of them. Rearranging this equation a bit, we can see that it's just a quadratic equation. We'll solve for m and get two solutions. Because we constructed this function in such a way that z represents a counting variable, we want to write this function in the form of a polynomial so that we can look at the coefficients and powers of z as we did a moment ago. So let's take the Taylor series of each of these to get them into the form of a polynomial. Right away, we can see that some of the coefficients are negative for the second power series, so this can't possibly represent how many paths there are, since it doesn't make sense to talk about a negative number of paths. So we can discard that one, and we're left with the power series we're looking for. The way that we encoded this infinite sequence in a single function makes it a form of a generating function, because all we had to do to decode the sequence is find the Taylor series of the function. And now we have everything we need to answer our original question of how many ways there are to arrange n pairs of parentheses. If we have n pairs of parentheses, we know that each open parenthesis maps to an up step in its corresponding path, and each closing parenthesis corresponds to a down step. So the path length will have length 2n. So if we have four pairs of parentheses, we look at the term, which has 8 as its exponent, and this tells us that there are 14 ways to validly arrange them. There are many other interesting paths with different constraints which we can analyze by making generating functions following the same kind of process as we just did. I encourage you to learn more about them, and maybe in a future video, I can show some of their cool properties. I should also mention that the sequence of integers we derived that shows up as the coefficients in our power series are called Catalan numbers. I showed a method of deriving them using a generating function, but it can also be done combinatorically. Consider a path just like the ones described earlier, except remove the restriction that the path must stay above the line y equals 0, but it still must start and end on that line. How many of these paths are there of length 2n? Since the path starts and ends on y equals 0, then there must be the same number of up steps as there are down steps. And the path will be entirely determined by the placement of its up steps, since we know the remaining steps must be down steps. So since the path has length 2n, we know exactly n of these will be up steps, and we can choose to arrange them however we like to form a unique path. So the number of unique paths of length 2n will be 2n choose n. But remember, this is describing paths that can go under y equals 0 as well. So how do we find the number of paths following our original constraints? For some path, consider the number of down steps that has below the line y equals 0. I will call this the exceedance of the path. If a path has an exceedance of some positive k, there's a sneaky trick to transform it into a path of exceedance k minus 1. After the first time the path crosses below the y equals 0 line, find the up step that brings it back to y equals 0. I'll call this segment x. Now take the sections of the path before and after x and swap them. We now have a new path with exceedance k minus 1. Wait, hold on, why did that work? The right segment starts and ends on y equals 0, and moving it to the start of the path won't change that, so the right segment will have no effect on the exceedance. The left segment starts on y equals 0 originally. Once we swap the right and left segment, the original right half will end at y equals 0, but then, since x is an up step, the original left half will be starting one higher than it was originally. 
So since it was shifted up by 1, it will have 1 fewer down steps below y equals 0, therefore decreasing its exceedance by 1. And since this process is easily reversed, we know that each path with positive exceedance k has a corresponding path with exceedance k minus 1, and vice versa, creating a bijection. Then, if we partition the set of paths of length 2n into groups by their exceedance level, each group will be the same size. The maximum exceedance will be n, since there are n down steps, and so there will be n plus 1 exceedance groups, since we are including the group of zero exceedance. And in fact, it's the group with zero exceedance that we're interested in, since these are the paths which don't go below the y equals zero line. All of the groups together constitute the 2n choose n paths possible, but we are only interested in the group with zero exceedance, so we'll just divide by the total number of groups to get 1 over n plus 1 times 2n choose n. And this is the combinatoric equation for the Catalan numbers. So, using the same example as earlier, if we have four sets of parentheses, we can substitute n with 4 to get 14 valid arrangements, just as before. This proof for the combinatoric equation was formulated by Joseph Rukovica, and I'll put a link to his paper in the description.